Hello and welcome to this detailed build guide on how to make your very own high-end PC soundbar. Now if you've not seen this yet, I highly suggest you check out the video on the main DIY Perks channel, but briefly it comprises a pair of high quality speaker drivers built into an enclosure that can not only support a monitor and provide somewhere to stow a keyboard and mouse, but the unit also features a built-in light strip, USB hub, headphone option and a built-in subwoofer for a really impactful sound. Performance-wise, it sits comfortably above the sound quality provided by soundbars of a similar cost, and it's within touching distance of highly tuned pro-grade speakers, despite being cheaper than them and more suited for desktop use. Stay tuned for some testing and examples of this later on in the video, which by the way is split into several chapters for you to um, look at the information that you are interested in. If you get stuck, feel free to visit the Discord server where you'll find many like-minded folk who will be happy to help you out. And if you want to help to develop this project further, please visit the forum at forum.diyperks.com where you can present your ideas in a detailed post and have them easy for others to find. In terms of construction, as I mentioned in the main video, I've used some bamboo floorboards for an interesting aesthetic, but MDF is also an option if you don't mind dealing with its dust and painting it afterwards. In fact, MDF actually has a few properties that make it great for audio projects that some of you guys notified me about in the previous video's comments. Notably that it has a consistent density, which means that weird resonances are less of an issue, so going with 15mm MDF would probably result in the best acoustic response. Whether you'll notice or not, I don't know. If you do use flooring, you'll definitely want to sand them down on both sides to remove the coating that's covering them, as it not only makes the wood look plasticky, but also harms glue adhesion. Because this is so time consuming to do, using floorboards like this might not be even worth it at all to you, but it was fun to explore it for the main video. For those wondering, I also experimented with using a planer to take off the top coat, but unfortunately it very quickly blunted the planer's blades, so be mindful of that as well. No matter what material you choose, it'll need to be cut down to size to make the main enclosure for the speaker. And to keep things simple, there are really only three sizes here. Two larger pieces for the platform, with everything else being made out of strips. You can see the dimensions of everything on screen, and you can also find this as a template on the project's page on the DIY Perks website. There you'll also find a 3D SketchUp model that's fully to scale to help you to understand how the build fits together and to check out measurements and things like that. This has been carefully designed to match the recommended enclosure sizes of the drivers we'll be using, which consist of a pair of Dayton Audio Transformer tweeters, a pair of Tectonic Elements Balance Mode Radiators, and finally a Slimline Subwoofer, again by Dayton Audio. The process of working out the required enclosure volume for speakers like these is usually pretty easy, as they're often presented on the product pages on places like Sound Imports and Parts Express. They're in cubic feet usually, which I find less intuitive than working things out in litres, so I usually convert it with a calculator for ease. In the case of the mid-range drivers, they will work nicely in a sealed enclosure just over a quarter of a litre. Though, as the intended shape is a bit weird, the easiest way to make sure that it's the right size is to use CAD software to do the heavy lifting, which in my case is just SketchUp, which is free. This value in cubed millimetres is just over what we need, which is perfect as the volume of the driver itself and wiring will be accommodated with this slight oversizing. This same method was used to verify the sizing of the subwoofer enclosure, which needs to be approximately 10 litres. If you can't find pre-calculated recommended enclosure volumes for a given driver, it's also possible to use a speaker's specifications to plot what's ideal with software like Q speakers, including the addition of ports and their dimensions, but that's beyond the scope of this guide for now. Either way, with the volume of the enclosures confirmed, we'll start by making the smaller of the two platform pieces. If you're using floorboards like I am, these will need to be glued together to make a larger sheet, with standard wood glue being suitable here along with some clamps while it dries. Once it has dried, the platform needs a hole cut out for the subwoofer, for which using a hand router is ideal. The process for this involves clamping the platform onto a piece of scrap wood and then drilling a small hole through its centre, making sure that it goes right down into the scrap piece underneath. 
The whole point of this hole is to use it as a pivot point by attaching a piece of acrylic to the bottom of the router and then pinning it to the hole with a nice long screw that goes right into the scrap wood underneath. This ensures that the router can only rotate around this point, allowing for nice controlled cuts. Each pass needs to be fairly shallow. I'd suggest using 4mm at first, but if your router starts straining you'll need to go shallower than that. This outer ring is slightly wider than the diameter of the subwoofer, with a radius of 77mm from the centre of the screw to the furthest side of the router's bit. This will allow the speaker to sit within this channel, but it's very important not to go all the way through the wood as we'll need to leave a lip for the speaker to sit on. So after routing out a 6mm deep channel, we need to adjust the diameter of the circle that the router is cutting. This is as simple as moving the screw closer to the router, and the radius of this cut needs to be 70mm from the centre of the screw to the furthest side of the router's cutting bit. This again needs to be 6mm deep just to make the channel wider, to form a more substantial lip. This process needs to again be repeated, only this time with a radius of 64mm and going right through to the scrap wood. And at this point you'll realise the idea behind having the scrap wood underneath. It not only protects the worktop, but also continues to anchor the router through the central screw so that you don't lose control of it. Once lifted out you can see how neat this is, and one of the reasons for that is for using a straight cut router bit, rather than an upcut router bit, as it doesn't pull up on the wood as it's chipping away and results in a cleaner edge. As you can see the driver fits in it perfectly. So to build the subwoofer chamber around this, we can use some strips of wood around the edge to make a perimeter for it. It's worth noting that in the main video I actually devised some ports by leaving a gap around these edges, but with further testing I believe that the speaker driver works far better in a sealed enclosure, so I recommend leaving these out entirely and going with a completely sealed area for the sub instead, as shown on screen. As long as the surface is free from any lacquer or coating, you should be able to glue these together with wood glue just fine, although if you are using floorboards like I am, the underside may have channels like this, so using some expanding glue is recommended to fill these gaps. Now before capping this area off, it's important to add any knobs and switches to its underside. Here I added a hole for the brightness knob of the LED lighting system, and also a hole for a switch intended to send the signal either straight to the amplifiers for the speakers or to a headphone socket, but more on that later. We're going to cap this area off with the larger of the two platform pieces, but as you can see the speaker doesn't quite fit when it's added. This is because I've used 15mm thick floorboards, so there's not quite enough thickness to allow space for the speaker, so I just used the router to remove some material in the larger platform piece to make a cutout for the speaker's rear, which allows it to fit nicely. So with the fit confirmed and the switches and knobs all added and sealed with glue, it can be glued in place, though you may want to add a couple of smaller blocks flanking the speaker to help rigidity in this area. looking good, though you may need to sand down the front to make all the pieces properly flush. So with the first section of this build made, we can now expand the sealed subwoofer chamber to add more air volume to it. To do this we'll need our first strip of 90mm wide wood, and to make vent areas along one side, we can simply use a spade bit to drill out at regular intervals and then bridge between them with a saw, basically making a few pillars. This panel is a great place for a USB hub as well, so a similar method can be used to make a gap for it. Two holes bridged together with a saw and then sanded down for smoothness. For mounting purposes it's easiest just to use hot glue and a few right angle brackets. It's not pretty but it does make for a good seal and is quick to do. So with that done this length can now be glued in place along the entire back edge of the platform section, remembering to add glue underneath the individual pillars as well. Once it's dry you should have something that looks like this, and it's ready for two support legs that fit on each side. To make these we'll simply use the remaining 90mm strips to make two long square boxes, approximately 500mm in length. You'll notice that I've offset one side by 75mm, and this is to allow air in from the subwoofer chamber, as we're going to use some of the inside of this area to contribute to the air volume that the subwoofer has to work with. 
To define an endpoint, it does however need a divider glued inside, which needs to be 300mm inset from the back. I used Gorilla Glue here so that it would expand to fill any gaps, although don't forget to add a through hole for the speaker wires to go through later. Now at this point I made some ports for the mid-tone speaker drivers here as well, but again after testing I found that the sound was much cleaner without them, so again I suggest leaving these out entirely for the best results. So with the internal work completed, we can now add the lid. Once this is all dried, we need to mark the front of where the divider is and draw it on the outside. This is so that we can tell where it is, so that we can draw some 30 degree lines out from the corner that's going to be on the upper inside of the unit, the same side that the gap is on on the back. These lines need to be followed on all four sides to make a flat plane that can be carefully cut along using a saw. This takes a while to do, so don't rush, Take your time, be light, and once the cut is started, it's possible to speed up if necessary. Continually stop and check where the lines are to make sure your cut is straight, and be careful not to nick your desktop like I did. I finished mine off in free air, but clamping it more firmly is recommended for safety. This results in a really cool angle that will point the stereo drivers directly towards the listener for optimal audio quality. To make fronts for these sections, they must first have holes made in them for the speaker drivers. As mentioned in the main video, these drivers have specifically been chosen to work together beautifully, and the same circle cutting method can be used with the router to make holes for them, only as the mid-tone speaker has an irregular shape on the outside, it needs to be manually trimmed wider to fit. The tweeter driver needs to be offset slightly inwards to fit within the chamber, so we can mark 2cm inwards from the centre of the main driver and again route it out from this line. It's worth noting that the tweeter drivers are usually provided with an extended front mounting grille that needs to be removed for it to fit here. To ensure an airtight fit around the drivers, we'll be using some black tack putty, which needs to be carefully added around the perimeter of each driver. The main driver can be held in place with some very short self-tapping screws that won't go through to the other side of the wood, whereas the tweeter can simply be held in place with hot glue. Now if you find that the rear screws on the tweeter driver won't allow the front to fit flush against the enclosure, you can either trim off the screw or file out a gap in the wood to give it some more space. Now before this gets sealed up, it's important to add some wires to each of the drivers, being careful to make sure that you use a red wire for the positive tab of each, so you know which way to wire them up later, as phase is important. I recommend using decently thick wiring for this, so that it won't alter the audio in any way. I'm using 14AWG. Now when it comes to mounting these, as the angle is a bit weird, I found that holding it upright with some sand allows the glue surface to be flat, so that gravity can hold the front down while it dries. Once it has dried, the saw can again be used to trim it down to match the enclosure and preserve the cool angles. Mixing leftover dust with some wood glue is a good way of filling any gaps, finishing things off nicely with some sanding. Sealing the drivers in like this might not be to everyone's taste, but using screws instead and making sure it's sealed would be quite tricky to do, and besides, if you did ever need to replace the drivers, it's possible to cut along the glue line with a saw to remove the front without affecting its appearance. These two units can now be glued to either side of the subwoofer enclosure, though this is best done upside down to keep everything lined up, and once it's dried we can now start adding its internal components. First up is the LED lighting. This is just standard 12 volt LED strip lighting, though I suggest some with a decent CRI for pleasant illumination. To mount them we're going to use a length of LED strip channeling, though as it's made out of aluminium I suggest taping off both of the ends of the strip to prevent any of the cut copper traces from shorting out if they happen to touch the aluminium surface. This stuff comes with a diffusion cover that softens the light output from the LEDs significantly, making it much easier on the eyes, and the whole thing can be glued to the inside corner behind the subwoofer with its power wire going through a hole. I suggest using CT1 style glue here as it sticks to both wood and aluminium well. 
This can now be hooked up to the LED dimmer that I mentioned earlier and glued in place to keep it nice and safe. As we'll be powering the entire speaker with 15 volts, that would overload the LEDs, which require just 12 volts. So we'll power this dimmer through a voltage step downboard, although you may need to add a filter comprised of a couple of coils and capacitors on its voltage input so that it won't send interference out to the amplifiers, which will also be on the same power rail. To make an inset power socket for this, we can drill four holes in a length of wood and bridge between them to make a cutout, the side of which can now have a hole made in it for the power socket. As you can see, I've filed out an oval here as well to provide an extra hole for the USB hub's connector to exit through, with the whole thing being capped off with a spare piece of wood. When mounting this, I suggest using expanding glue to fill any gaps, the same going for the rear panel. The subwoofer too can be screwed in place, although its wires will need to be added in reverse polarity. This is because it faces downwards into an enclosed area which affects its phase compared to the other drivers. With that done, we're ready to add the amplifiers. I suggest using two here, one being a 4-channel AB amplifier for the main stereo drivers, and the other being a single-channel Class D amplifier for the subwoofer. Links to which you can find in the description. The AB amplifier isn't quite as efficient as the Class D amp, but usually AB amplifiers have much higher audio quality and also a far lower noise floor, which is important for speakers with such clarity as there's basically no audible hiss. As it's got four channels, it means we can modify the signal going to each channel before it gets amplified and sent to the speakers, essentially making for a super simple and highly customizable crossover that can be made out of low-cost components. You see, with just a couple of resistors and capacitors, it's possible to roll off parts of an audio signal, which allows us to select which frequencies get sent to each individual speaker driver. These filters are called low-pass and high-pass filters, and I use an online calculator to work out the values for these, and you can find a link to it in the description for when you're doing your own projects. As we want three sets of frequencies, treble, mid-range and bass, we first need to split the signal by sending it through three 820 ohm resistors. These resistors in themselves don't affect the audio, but mean that anything done after them won't inadvertently affect the other channels. The first signal we'll modify will be for the tweeters. I found that rolling off frequencies below 5kHz worked well, so this requires the signal to pass through a 5.6 nanofarad capacitor, followed by a 5.6kΩ resistor going to ground. This ensures that the tweeters only play sounds above 5kHz. The second signal we'll modify is for the mid-range drivers. As these are capable of playing high-pitched notes, we need to pull them down in order to allow the tweeter drivers to handle them instead, as they do a better job. So we'll start rolling the signal off at 2kHz, and this merely requires a 100 nanofarad capacitor to go to ground after the 820 ohm resistor. Because of the soft slope of these filters, the gap between 2kHz and 5kHz is filled by the taper, resulting in a smooth flat response. The last filter we'll need to make is for the subwoofer, so we'll actually be chaining three of these filters together, the first one rolling off the signal at 88Hz with a 2.2 microfarad capacitor, the next 60Hz and the final one at 50Hz with the values shown on screen. As the subwoofer signal is attenuated quite a bit by these three filters, we'll compensate for that by adding some manual attenuation to both the treble and mid-range signals as well to bring them down to match, and this can be done by using a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor, followed by a 100 ohm resistor to ground on each. As the AB amplifier that these signals go to is actually rated for a much higher wattage than the speakers themselves, attenuating the signal like this is actually necessary anyway to avoid blowing the drivers, so as a whole the setup works really well together. When making this circuit, I suggest using a strip board with the centre strip being ground and the outermost strips being the untouched signal input that we'll be modifying, both the left and the right channels. For example, here I'm making the treble filter, with the signal first passing through the 820 ohm resistor to the next row. This row then has a 5.6 nanofarad capacitor added to it, with the trace being broken underneath so that the signal can only flow through the capacitor, 
This signal then gets partially sent to ground through a 5.6 ohm resistor, and the remainder goes to the output wires. This process needs to be repeated until all three filters have been constructed for both the left and right channels. As you can see, I've used different capacitor types for each of these, but only because that's what I had to hand. Pretty much any non-polarised capacitor type will work, so use whatever you can get your hands on. I've used pin connectors on my signal out wires so that they can be plugged directly into the amplifier's input, though do note that it's necessary to flip both of these switches to the side closest to the numbers before use or you'll get a weird signal response. I think they might be wired up wrong or something because they don't seem to work for their intended purpose. As you can see, each of the amplifier channels needs output wires adding for hooking up to the speakers, though you'll need to make a note of which ones are for the treble drivers and which ones are for the main drivers, and of course, left and right as well, so that you don't have to mess around later if you connect them up wrong. This process can be repeated for the subwoofer amplifier, with the power wires for both amps being connected to the recessed power jack we added earlier. As I mentioned in the main video, the signal for all of this comes from a USB soundboard also known as a DAC, or digital to analog converter that can output its audio signal through some phono sockets. This one is really high quality and quite expensive, so an alternative would be to send the audio to the amps directly through a 3.5mm auxiliary input socket if you wanted a more budget friendly option, which as you can see I've added here alongside the unit's headphone output. Either way, the signal has to of course go through the crossover circuit first, so bear that in mind. If you do use a USB soundboard like I am, a great place to plug it into is the side of the USB hub, as this means that the entire unit only requires one USB wire. Pretty neat. Anyway, with all that added, we can now close it up. I suggest using threaded inserts here to make this panel removable, and using something like thin draft excluder strips to seal it. I used putty, but it's so sticky that it makes the panel hard to remove, so I don't really recommend it. To power this thing, I suggest using an old 15 volt laptop power brick, as this is within the voltage range of the amplifiers. And for the USB soundboard and hub connection, I suggest using a 2 meter long USB extender. With it complete, it looks great, but how does it sound? After doing a brief sign sweep, the levels look fine. It's not ultra flat due to various room resonances, but it's good enough for a DIY speaker build I think, and this should be mirrored nicely with some audio tests. In the main video I did some tests with some binaural microphones while gaming, so check out the main video if that interests you. But here are some new tests, again using some common sound sources to give you a general idea of its quality. You'll need to listen to this on headphones, and you'll never really get a proper impression of how it sounds unless you hear it in person, so please bear that in mind.
As you could hopefully hear, the DIY build is in another league entirely compared to the soundbar, despite being a similar cost. It's not even a bad soundbar either, it's just that the DIY speaker is particularly nice sounding. It's even within touching distance of pro-grade bookshelf speakers that cost significantly more, and it trades blows depending on what kind of music you're listening to. Speaking of cost, it should be in the range shown on screen, although you can cut this nearly in half by making two changes. The first is to exclude the USB DAC and just use an analog audio input. The sound quality difference will barely be noticeable even for a trained ear. A further cost reduction can be made by excluding the tweeters and relying on the mid-tone drivers to cover this range. They are surprisingly good at it, and while you'll lose out a bit on detail, for some the difference will be slight enough that the cost benefit is more advantageous to them. It'll still sound great, only for an even greater value price point. So if you build one of these yourself, I hope you enjoy the process, and don't forget you can check out the Discord server if you get stuck. But other than that, I'm Matt, and you've been watching DIY Perks Extra, and I hope I see you on the main channel with another build soon. Goodbye for now.